today we're way up in the thumb area of Michigan and it has some interesting historical things here we're going to show you and I see we have an Amish horse cart coming along toward us right now I just wanted to slow down and show you guys this as it goes by all right we're here Sanilac Petroglyph State Park just wanted to let you guys know I got the idea for this video from my friend Alma at Genya's Journeys and she did a really great vlog about some Native American petroglyphs out in the desert of Arizona. Beautiful scenery and a really really nice job on all of her videos. I hope you guys will check out her channel too. Now we're gonna head on back and see the famous Sanilac petroglyphs. Open Wednesday through Sunday Memorial Day to Labor Day. All right, for a state park, it doesn't really have a lot of facilities here available. It's a limited little dirt lot for parking here. Maybe holds, I'd say, 15 cars at the most. And a couple of picnic tables and the walking trail, which is open year round. One small like outhouse type facility here. And if we head up here, we can see a trail map. All right, this is interesting. The trail map here will show you the wildlife of the area. It's called a floodplain forest. These are just some of the animals around here. Oh, let's hope we don't see the uh, northern water snake. I'm not real fond of snakes, but everything else here, yeah, I'm not too worried about. So, um, let's see. There's some native plants here. Partridge berries, gooseberries, blueberries, wild natural blueberries here. Uh, Wintergreen, wild strawberries. Pretty nice assortment of plants. But whatever it comes here for, for what most people come here for, are the Native American petroglyphs. Um, discovered over 100 years ago. The Michigan Archaeological Society purchased this property and deeded it to the state in 1971 to preserve this important spot for the Great Lakes tribes. Uh, respectful visitors are welcome. Let's see. All right. We are right here where we parked at. It just they say it's about a quarter mile walk around this little curvy trail here. There's some signs. And then the petroglyphs, I believe, are enclosed here. And we're going to have a walk down there to find them and have a look. And I won't bore you with the quarter mile walk here because it's so bouncy and me walking up and down not able to hold my camera still like I should. Oh, and if you notice the new hat on I have today, I don't usually wear a hat anyway, but I got this one in Cuba for a souvenir when I was there a couple weeks ago. And no, I have not become a communist or socialist, but the hat itself is kind of fun. So we're off walking again. Hey, we're here at the Sanilac Petroglyphs State Park, and this is the giant rock that's outcropping here and has been carved with Native American petroglyphs, symbols that are important to the Native people here in America. And I have a tour guide here who's going to talk a little bit about it for us. This is the only recognized petroglyph in Michigan, right? Okay. And... We're going to go over some of the symbols here that have been found and what they mean. Here's a drawing that was done by Cranbrook Institute scientists back in 1922. And you can see it's changed a lot over the years. There's been a lot of natural weathering and decay, along with some ongoing vandalism issues in the past. If we look really close right here at the center of the rock, we can see these square cutouts and kind of rounded cutouts there, possibly that one, and a big one over on that side there where they think that people have tried to cut out petroglyphs to take as souvenirs or collectibles. And that all happened before it was a state park, right? Yeah. Okay. We're going to look at the first one here, which is described as a water panther. And there's an actual drawing down there for you to see of what the carving would look like in full detail. 
before the weathering took place. And the water panther is a creature that lives in the lakes and rivers, I suppose, and causes the storms to occur. But, uh, always either in the spring or the fall, but when it was always locked. Oh, okay. And I said, one of these years we're going to come, back, come by in the summer so I can see this stuff up close. That's right. Definitely. Okay, so this is what's known as a night walker. Its head is right there. It's a stick figure. These are its legs. If you look closely, you'll see next to it right here is a small child or a spirit. Uh, tribes here in the Midwest believe that the night walker is a benevolent spirit who helps to transition people from this life into the next life, helps them to have safe crossing. And this would be representative of a night walker taking a spirit to the next life. For tribes out west, like Arizona or New Mexico, they believe that the night walker is an evil spirit that would sneak in in the middle of the night and would steal the children and eat them. Very different belief. Yeah, it's a little bit different take on it. Mm -hmm. And then this is known as the chief of knowledge. This is him pulling back his arm, shooting his bow and arrow. This is an incredibly sacred icon. It's believed that this was revisited and recarved several times throughout history based on how deep this carving is compared to the rest of the carvings that are on this rock. And this strange arrow pointing upward above his head represents knowledge and him passing his knowledge upwards into the heavens so that it can be passed down to future generations. Now how about this one right here, he didn't say anything about this one last week. This here. is a peace pipe right down here. So we've got the pipe and we've got the feather decorations oh, on the back okay. of it. All right. That makes sense. We've got handprints. Oh, yes. A handprint here, a handprint here. This particular handprint has an extra finger. Six this fingers, is believed huh? to have been the signature or stamp of the carver. For tribes here in the Midwest, they believe people who were born with an extra finger or toe were considered to be blessed by the spirits. They were given some kind of special gift or ability. For tribes out west, people with an extra finger were considered to be untrustworthy. Hmm. Which is why when they'd meet somebody, they'd put up their hand and they would say how or hi, and they'd be looking for an extra finger. X's are birds in flight. Come down here. You can follow its flight path. It's an east to west pattern. So there's several. All the way up here. This is the first one. Oh, that's interesting. It might go with this carving right here. It's got a sideways head. It's got the body of a human. It's got a trident next to it. And it's got some feathers. This is part eagle, part man. This is known as the eagle spirit, and it said that the eagle spirit would fly around the world from east to west every single day, making sure that the different tribes are following their customs and their beliefs the way that they should be, and he keeps an eye on them. And there are some tribes, such as the Odawa or Ottawa tribe, that believe that he saved their people from the great flood. So he's like their protector. Four triangles on that line. I believe that the Cass River that flows just behind us actually at one point came up to this rock. This rock was riverfront back then. And it's believed that this is not a site where any tribe lived. This was a sacred meeting place or a sacred ceremony site that the different tribes would travel to. They would meet here every so often and work out any kind of differences or disputes they might be having among the different tribes. This might explain the peace pipe. Now it said so that each tribe was represented equally. They were only allowed to bring one chief to this meeting, and he was only allowed to bring with him three people to row his canoe. See how this is a canoe? Mm -hmm. and that would be the four people on the canoe. Mm -hmm. We've got spirals on here. Spirals represent different things to different cultures. For some, it represents water. 
For others, it represents outer space, and for others, it represents a circle of light. If this is representing the circle of light, the larger the spiral is, the longer the lifespan of a person it's representing, and the smaller the spiral, the shorter the lifespan. There was originally about six spirals on this rock. To this day, you can see about three of them. They're very common. They're found all, all around the world at various historical sites. This is one of the high spirits to the Native Americans. Head is right there. This is its flipper. This is a sea turtle. This is one of the high spirits to the Native Americans. It's believed that he originally lived in Lake Superior, or what was called Lake Gitchigumi. His name is Gitchi Manitou, and he became outcast from his family, so he moved more toward the Straits of Mackinac. He enlisted the help of all of his animal friends to help him build his new home. Many tried, many failed, except for the otter. The otter would swim below the water, pick up handfuls of mud, and built him his home that we would call today Mackinac Island. Mm -hmm. If you look at Mackinac Island, it is shaped like a turtle, and it's got the topography of a turtle shell. So Native Americans do believe that Gitche Manitou lived on Mackinac Island. And he is incredibly sacred to the Native Americans because they believe that he is the creator of all creatures. This is the largest petroglyph on the rock. It's all the way up down here, all the way here, and it's got lines on both sides. This is a thunderbird. It said that the thunderbird is so large when he flies past the sun he can completely cover it, which would be what we would call a solar eclipse. It's also believed that during the rainstorms, he claps his wings extremely loud and he shoots lightning bolts out of his eyeballs. That's how Native Americans would explain thunder and lightning or thunderstorm. Yeah. And we've got just a couple more over here. We've got seven lines at the top, one line here, three lines at the bottom. There are two different beliefs for what this represents given the different tribes' input. Some tribes believe that this is a menorah, and they believe that they are descendants of one of the seven long lost tribes of ancient Israel. The other belief is that this represents a family tree, and a prophet brought seven teachings, which are the seven top lines, to one chief. That one chief then passed those teachings down to his three sons. Those three sons went on to form their own tribes and they became known as the Three Fires or the three largest tribes in Michigan. These next few carvings, there are several of these and they're all over the rock. Uh, I'm just going to point to as many of them as I see. Sure. And these are hands carved into the rock. Oh, yeah, I noticed this when I first walked there, out. There. Yep. One there. One there. There's one sort of over there. Now, there are hands carved all over the rock. These just happen to be the ones that are easiest to see. I'm going down, and then three lines on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now, some people will say this is with the belief that some people do hold that the Native Americans are descended from the lost tribes of Israel. And the other interpretation, however, is more accepted by the tribes in the area, and that is that it's sort of a family tree. And that has to do with their deeper heritage. Okay, yeah, the Thunderbird is basically just a giant eagle with the neck, wingspan, and eye. And he was so big he would block out the sun when he flew by. He had a relationship with the underwater panther. Because when she made it rain, the Thunderbird couldn't fly. So he would try everything he could to scare her off. He would flap his wings really hard, making thunder and wind. He'd get lightning out of his eyes, just really anything to make her leave. And usually it wouldn't work. It would just make her even angrier. So she would make it rain even harder. And that's how they explain thunderstorms. Okay. And so there's just like three actual personages depicted on this. you got the Nightwalker, the... Eagle man, eagle, 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 man? eagle man or the East Man? And the Hunter. Essentially. Okay. Those are the only three sort of personages that we have names for. There are a lot of human figures that are just carved into the rock that we don't have names for. All right. There was also like a little like basin in the rock where water accumulates and you can see where it runs out at. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking well, that's that one next to a sign because that one sounds like a... Yeah. yeah, that's an example of something that there are quite a few of in this area. We call them potholes. Oh, it's just a naturally occurring thing? Oh, it's 
kind of naturally occurring. There's actually an interesting explanation. <laughs> okay. Uh, what happened is when the glaciers were retreating, those would have been places where there was a harder stone. So rather than just push that down with the rest of the sand and the silt, the glacier would rip that stone out. So those are where stones used to be, but the Native Americans that came here sort of adapted those natural potholes slightly so they could use them to grind their grain. Oh. Which is why you might have noticed there was a smaller hole next to it and a bit of a trough between the two. Yes, yes. So that's where they would have put their water and their grain so they could uh, grind it up. Excellent. Excellent. I did not know that. I noticed it coming in. I thought, I wonder what the story is on that. So, Indeed. All right, just one more question, if you don't mind. I know it's probably getting late, but um, I heard there was some vandalism here last year. Yeah, um, we've had a few acts of vandalism. I think the one last year was spray paint, and we were able to clean that up. Okay. Uh, but a couple of years ago, somebody broke in, and they carved a cat, a hand, and mushrooms on this rock and several other rocks along the trail. I see. Now, the cat and the hand, you can't really see from the edge at all. Uh, you can only see from the top. All right. Uh, but the mushrooms... Which, which one is that? Down? Oh, right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very, very shallow carving. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's probably just something with a pocket knife. Yeah, yeah. We could take Any a grinder and polish that off. <laughs> Any other questions? No, I, I don't think so. Um, yes, that's good. I'm glad you were here to give me all these great details about it. I appreciate it, sir. What was your name? Casey. Casey? Well, thank you, Casey, very much. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Sad to think that those petroglyphs, if they're not... Uh, something doesn't change, they'll be gone in just a few generations. All right, we're all finished up with our official tour. We had a wonderful tour from tour guide Casey, who's a summer intern here. And it was just really, really fun and very educational. And I highly recommend everybody who's anywhere near this area with an interest in Native American history and the history of Michigan to come out here and see for yourself and experience a tour. It's really, really interesting. And I thank the fine people here for talking to us and showing us the details that we would have missed on our own. Just seeing those carvings, though, and learning how they came to be prominent makes you wonder how many more buried things like that could be in the woods, not just in this area close by to the rock carvings, but all across Michigan and the whole country. Things that are buried just out of sight that could well be historical treasures that just yet to be uncovered. All right, this rock we showed you on our way in with these hole marks in it here, those could well be a directional indicator showing people the way of the trail. And this particular rock here is like a semi-natural occurrence our guide said that may have been used for either collecting water or collecting grinding of grain, putting grain in the hollowed out part and then mixing it with a grinding stone, possibly. So, that's fascinating. There we go. So, we're going to keep walking on back toward our parking spot. And he mentioned the big fire, the uh, Michigan fire that occurred over 100 years ago. We're actually probably close to 125, 130 years ago. We're going to do a video about that. We're going to do a separate video about the big Michigan Thumb area fire and how many people died and what what such a huge area that the fire actually covered. We can see on this map how close we actually are to the Cass River, which is a large navigable river it flows from right near, it has its actual headwaters just about a mile from here in this little stream coming in here where it widens out into the Cass River and flows just a little ways away from where we're standing. And from there it makes its way all the way down to Saginaw Bay, which would have certainly been a popular mode of transport for the Native Americans years ago. They would have traveled this river back and forth by a canoe, which would make sense what he was saying about this being a meeting place for the natives years ago. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this tour today of the only Native American petroglyphs in Michigan. And we hope you'll take some time, get out there and explore for yourself, do some interesting different things that you might not otherwise think about doing, learn a little bit about your local history, and 
We want to say thanks for watching. Have a great day.